come today as we gather in worship. And as we do so, we celebrate the Reformation, which is a reminder of God's grace through the cross of Jesus Christ and the gift of forgiveness. And of course, all that started with Martin Luther more than 500 years ago at the beginning of the Reformation. One reminder today, I wanna to let you know that next week is All Saints Day. And I want you to please contact the church office if you have a loved one or a friend you would like included by name in our commemoration of All Saints Day. And it would be someone especially who had been called to be with the Lord in this past year. And so as we begin worship today, we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. From Psalm 96, Lord, you have been a dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed in the evening, it fades and withers. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper us, offer us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. A mighty fortress is our God, a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. The old says and Yeah. 
time we join together in professing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, you are the holy lawgiver. You are the salvation of your people. By your spirit, renew us in your covenant of love and train us to care tenderly for all our neighbors through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test, test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And his second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is our Gospel reading.
Our sermon reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But for God, proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him for the, from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to jump into our second passage in our sermon series this week. Last week we began moving through Paul's letter to the Romans. And um, I really loved how Pastor Richard said last week what functionally is kind of a review of what makes us Lutheran, what makes us distinct. And so we gave a bit of a lens last week to view um, how we tend to understand Scripture. We have law, we have gospel. And this week we're going to continue that trend because, quite frankly, Romans could have been written by a Lutheran. In fact, we kind of assume because Luther is trying to reform and restore um, what had been lost uh, in the Middle Ages as he's trying to reform the Catholic Church, To be Lutheran is to get back to the heart of what the gospel is all about. Anyway, before we jump in, let's let's open with a quick prayer. Father, I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather this morning, if not in person or through this amazing opportunity to worship online together. I pray that you equip me to proclaim your message faithfully, give me the right words to say, and Lord, I pray that you continue to strengthen this online community in such a way that we can reflect your glory. You can open our hearts to hear your word today and let it change us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, some of you may know, most of you don't, but those that are close to me know that I, a fully grown adult man, love professional wrestling. It's one of those kind of funny things where, yes, and you're thinking professional wrestling, not amateur wrestling, not MMA, not UFC, not any other sports really, but that sort of big theater drama of fake fighting, professional wrestling, exactly what you think of, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, I love it. Uh, And if you want to ask me why, I I can go to a number of reasons, but anytime you get into something you love, you, you start to discover that there's insider lingo, there's insider phrasing, that the more you get into that thing you enjoy, the more you find these phrases and words that have very specific meanings that if you share them with anybody outside, it it doesn't make a lot of sense. For example, in professional wrestling, there's a lot of terms that have their origins in, in sort of carnivals. And so fans historically were called marks, which was a kind of crude way to say people that you could get money from. Uh, But in professional wrestling, there's some unique terms as well, such as heel, which is the bad guy, or the face, which is the good guy. And sometimes the heel, who is the bad guy, will have a face turn. In other words, the heel will become the good guy. Another important word to know um, in professional wrestling is heat. Now, you may think of heat as keeping a fire going or providing warmth, but in professional wrestling, heat means to get the crowd to hate you. So the heel wants to get heat so that way when the baby face, the face wins the match and everybody cheers because you want to see the bad guy lose. Heel, face, heat. One other phrase that always stands out to me is selling. 
in professional wrestling, it's important to be able to sell. And what that means is if you get hit with a fake looking punch, well, you have to make it look real. And one of the most egregious things you can do in professional wrestling in a match is to no sell, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm not gonna make it look like it hurts. Anyway, I could have a full conversation with a friend of mine and say, man, I can't believe how that heel no sold the face's offense and really failed to build up any heat. So when the face finally staged his comeback, it didn't do much. And for anybody outside, it sounds like a bunch of nonsense words strung together. Now, I think the same thing can be really true when we're talking about Bible words, and especially words that have to do with our Christian identity, what has to do with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so there are some phrases you'll see in Scripture or heard repeated over and over that kind of start to lose or maybe never had any real definite meaning. And when you hear those words, it just feels like lingo. Or maybe in the context of something like heat and wrestling, you think you know what that word means, but it means something a lot more specific and totally different in the right context. And so as we move through Romans, and especially as we move through this passage, there are going to be a few words that have that sort of really church lingo. We say it over and over, but often it's just words that don't have that concrete definition. Now, you may have noticed that we are wearing red this morning. And that's because we're celebrating Reformation Sunday. We're celebrating Reformation Sunday as this period where Luther, Martin Luther, the sort of the kicker offer of the Reformation began. And in this event, rediscovered what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, rediscovered the heart of the church, what we'd call the gospel. And a lot of that originated in a single question that Luther had, a big question. It's the big question that drove Luther's search to find out what the gospel was and how the church should be reformed. And that big question was this, how can I be righteous? Church lingo number one. How can I be righteous? What do we mean when we say righteous? Well, for Luther, what that really meant was something very simple. How could he be in the right relationship with God? When we say righteous, that means to be in the right relationship with something. And so to be righteous before God meant to be in his correct relationship. And Luther struggled with this because he saw what scripture said, which is that no one is good enough. In fact, we saw last week that everyone falls short of the glory of God. And Luther, as a monk, was racked with guilt over this because he knew what was expected of him to be righteous, to be right with God, but he also recognized this conflict, but if I am a sinner, what could I possibly do to make me good enough? And so he was terrified that in his final moments when he met his creator, he would not have measured up. What can you do as a Christian to be good enough to please God who is perfect? When no one is righteous, how can you be righteous? That is the fundamental question that was driving Luther to dive deeper into scripture. In his lectures as a professor, as a monk, he was trying to live out these things, these works, these things he could do to hopefully please God enough to both assuage his guilt and also put him in a righteous position before God, to be in the right relationship. Another way you could maybe say it is, how can I be at peace with God? And in his searching, in his searching and his struggling, Luther had a series of, of events that led him to going back to Romans, this letter that we're moving through now. And it is in this letter in Romans that he finds sort of the key that cracks the code, that reveals to him how he can be righteous, how he can please God, and how he can finally assuage that guilt. In Romans, he finds that you were made righteous. Another way to be made righteous is to be justified, to be proven that you are in the right relationship, another church lingo, by faith. So our first point today is that Luther's question, how can I be righteous, is through faith. So like I said, we have that insider lingo, lingo and you've probably heard this phrase a dozen times. Faith, I have faith. What is your faith? I have faith that it will rain tomorrow. I have faith 
I have faith that the New Orleans Saints will probably never go to another Super Bowl. We use that phrase all the time, and it's a very churchy word, but we don't always know what it means. But Luther finds in here, he says, I know I'm justified by faith. And it says in the passage, therefore, since we have been justified, made righteous, by faith, we have peace with God, righteousness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Boy, that's a lot of truth. It's a lot. And the first question we should be asking ourselves is, what do we mean by faith? I think for the most part, most people hear by faith and they think, well, I just believe something whether I know it's true or not. I have faith that Bigfoot exists. That's not what Luther meant by faith. And certainly not what Paul meant by faith. As Luther was exploring and preparing a series of lectures and a commentary on Romans, he wrote, faith is not something dreamed, uh, a human illusion. And I love this. This is incredibly true to my life. He says, when they hear the gospel, they miss the point. In their hearts and out of their own resources, in other words, what they can already imagine, they conjure up an idea which they call belief, which they treat as faith. And that's probably the definition of faith you have, right? I have an idea of how something should go, and I have faith that it will happen. That's not what Paul means by faith. It's not what Luther means by faith. To be a Lutheran means, means that we are saved through faith. Nothing else, no works we could do. And if you're like me, you're saying, okay, so what does that faith look like? How can I have enough faith? How can I believe enough in this idea that I've conjured up? How can I make sure that I have enough faith that now I'm good enough to please God? And that's missing the boat on what faith is. Faith is not having enough knowledge. Faith is not just trusting something blindly. Faith is something that happens to us. Faith is actually something God gives us through the Holy Spirit. Faith, as Luther understood it was this he said in that same preface he said faith is a living in other words it is ongoing and active and unshakable confidence a belief in the grace of god great more church words we know this though that faith is a living and unshakable confidence faith is something that we are in faith is a knowing that this is true that is faith. But the question is, how do we have enough faith? Can I work that faith out in myself? Can I make myself more confident? Can I increase my belief in the grace of God? And I'd say, well, no, because faith is something, as Luther would say, that God affects in us. Faith is this living and unshakable confidence that changes us. It's the means by which we're reborn. It's how we're made new. And just in case you think that you can work out that faith enough on your own, it's like, okay, then I just need to work on my faith. Paul in his letter keeps going and says, just in case you, you don't understand what, what actually justifies you. Yeah, it's faith, but Paul also says, since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. That's weird. We have over here justified, made righteous by faith, and we have over here that we're justified by the blood of Christ. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a belief in the grace of God? What does all of this church language mean? And it's easy to get sort of hung up on the insider lingo and just sort of check out. But we do need to remember we're saved through faith, and Paul really clarifies, he says, justified by his blood, that it's something that happens outside of us. The old Latin word would be extra nos, something we can't do for ourselves. Paul goes on to really clarify that that faith is a result of our second point. How can I be righteous? Well, by grace. Made righteous by grace through faith. So whereas last week we had law gospel. A super important distinction about being Lutheran. This week, we have, by grace, through faith, we're made righteous. So we already know through faith an unshakable confidence in the promises of God. Being righteous, to be at peace with, to be in the right relationship with God. And now we have grace, 
And I think it's important for us to take a second and just understand what we mean as a church when we say grace. It's not the prayer at mealtimes. What it means to have grace is, well, maybe it'd be easier to tell you a story. A little boy and his friends are playing baseball in the backyard, and they crack an incredibly beautiful hit off of it. Right to the next door neighbor's window. Shatters it. The little boys go home, tell their dad, this is what we did, and the dad says, all right, you need to go fess up, you gotta own it, you go to the front door. There's a few questions. First one would be, what is justice in that situation? And justice would be, the boys help either fix or pay for the window that was broken and anything else inside the house. And my next question would be, all right, so let's say the owner says, don't worry about it, I got it. A lot of you would say, well, that sounds like grace. And I'd say, no, not quite. It's not grace, it's mercy. The owner says, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay for the window. I've got it. Beautiful. That is mercy. Another way to imagine it is not getting something you deserve. Well, the question is, what is grace if it's not the same as mercy? Well, the owner of the house says, not only do you not have to pay for the window, I'm actually making dinner. Come on inside. Let me feed you as if you were my own kids. They don't deserve that. They don't even know the neighbor. But the neighbor, out of his own goodness, says, don't even worry about the baseball. In fact, let me feed you, take care of you, and treat you as if you're my family. That is grace. That is what grace is. We are saved by God's grace. Because if it was something that we had to do, if it was something we had to produce and make in ourselves, that's not trusting in God. That's not an unshakable confidence in Him. That's an unshakable confidence in our own works, our own ability to make it happen. But Paul's clear there's no way we could have made it happen. And he clarifies that in verse 6 where he says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He goes on in verse 8 to say, But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In verse 10 he says, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Grace is us getting what we don't deserve, when we could not offer anything up to God. In fact, when we were enemies of God, through Jesus' death, God invites us in to make us his own through Jesus Christ. And not because of anything we do, but only because of God's love and his goodness. That is what makes us righteous before God. And we hold on to that in faith an unshakable confidence that God is being truthful when he says, through Jesus Christ, I'm making mine. It's a very specific thing. We use those words loosely, but when you hear us say, by grace, it is that God, out of his own goodness, his own love, his own desire to come and pursue us, dies for us so that we may be invited in even when we were still sinners weak and enemies. Again, because it's Reformation Sunday, let's keep pulling the thread. Because in that same preface to this commentary, he says, grace is sufficient to enable us to be encounted, uh, I'm sorry, to be accounted entirely and completely righteous in God's sight. And this is my favorite part. Because grace does not come in portions and pieces separately like most gifts do. Rather, it takes us up completely into its embrace for the sake of Christ, our mediator and intercessor. It's a beautiful way to put that. Grace is God's just absolutely abundant love as a result of his goodness that takes us up completely. He loves us so much that while we were still sinners, trying to figure out how to make things work on our own, he sends Jesus Christ to die for us so that way we may be reconciled, made righteous. And on top of that, it says, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. We are invited into a new life, one we hold on to by a faith that is produced in us by God's great love. 
Luther's answer to this question, how can I be righteous, set up a chain of events that transformed, not just reformed, but transformed the church as we know it. It's an amazing thing to be a part of, to be a witness to everything as we worship together in these incredibly unique times. But that question is still there for you. How can you be righteous? It's pretty simple. It's that old Lutheran adage. Well, you're saved by grace through faith. So with that being said, my, my prayer for you is that you continue to embrace, hold on to that faith that you have, that confidence that you have, that you can trust in God's promises. You can trust in his grace that in and through Jesus Christ, you are reconciled to him. And I pray that it strengthens you in the midst of everything going on and through the rest of this week. With that being said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you, through driving one man to try to figure out how to be righteous before you, you opened his eyes and opened the door for us to understand that we are saved by your grace and through faith. And there's nothing else that we could offer and nothing else we are expected to offer. Lord, I pray that you strengthen us in this truth. I pray that you equip us to go out and proclaim that good news, that gospel, that message that this is available to all. I pray that you equip us to do this faithfully and, Lord, joyfully so we may rejoice in the hope we have in you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In your love, you speak to your church. Give courage and the bond of love to all who gather in your name 
that this love turns toward our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you guide with justice. Inspire leaders for truthful conversations and wise policies that decisions are made for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you tenderly care for your children and nurse them to health. Bring relief to all those who need healing, hope, or restoration this day. Especially, Lord, we pray for Jack as he awaits test results. Give him comfort as he does so. We pray for Maria and we ask for uh, her safety, especially as she travels. We pray for Peter and we ask for Peter's healing, Lord, as he's suffered a heart problem. Lord, these and all who have needs, those we know by name and those we do not, we lift before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you accompany us in life's transitions. We pray for new parents. We pray for those who are grieving a loss. We pray for those who are retiring. We pray for those who are beginning a new venture. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, at this time, we bring our other requests before you. We pray for the mission of the church. And we pray in particular that you would use us to proclaim the message of the Reformation, the Reformation of salvation by grace through faith. Lord, today we remember, even in the midst of this COVID pandemic, that you are in control of all things. Lord, continue to remind us of this great reality. Uh, Lord, today we remember our military personnel stationed throughout the world. We ask that you would keep them safe and allow them to return home quickly and safely. Almighty God, we remember missionaries too throughout the world, and those especially that find themselves in difficult circumstances. Uh, make the soil fertile for them and their ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, we remember those who were dear to us and now rest in you. We give thanks for Martin Luther and all who seek to reform and renew your church. Give us courage to live out your gospel, revealing your love until our days on earth have ended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold your loving arms all on all for whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Guide me, O thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.